Welcome back to Royals Weekly. I am your host, Marcus Mead, and joining me as always, the men who inspired the formation of the 90s pop supergroup Wilson Phillips, my brother Mike, and the great Alex Duvall. It's a lot of credit he's giving us there, Alex. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's way too much credit. Entirely. That's probably much before much. Alex's time. I don't know. Do you know Wilson Phillips, Alex? I know you're younger than I, we are. Vaguely. Very okay. Hold very on for good. one more day. But, <laughs> um, but I'm sure it was us and not their Rock and Roll Hall of Fame father, Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. Uh, you know, he was probably well, a terrible I, father. Okay, I did not know that. Yes. So they, <laughs> they are the daughters of... Uh, Brian and actually their grandmother was in the mamas and the papas. So, uh, no, no music going on in that family. I'm sure. I'm sure they never sang at gatherings or anything like that. So nope, that was all Alex. Uh, took the push on this from episode, seven year old me to do it. <laughs> on this week's episode, we'll review the final week of cactus league play, including the final uh, few roster decisions, which I know we have a lot to say about. Uh, we'll provide our preseason predictions, which everybody loves to follow. And I'm going to do better at this year. I promise. Uh, we'll also do a preview of the first series, but we're mostly, we're just really grateful to have Alex join us today. Alex Duvall, formerly of Royals Farm Report, the founder of that wonderful blog and uh, Twitter account, a brilliant mind when it comes to Royals, especially the minor league uh, portions. Thank you so much, Alex. We appreciate having you. No, thank you. I was, I, I was kind of going on a little bit of a drought here without expressing baseball opinions. And I saw you guys were recording and I literally, I would have fought Mike to have a shot at coming on hey. and, if, if it was only going to be two of us, I'd have at least entered my hat in the ring. Uh, luckily, it won't, won't be a test of endurance, I'll tell you that. Yeah, so. I tell you, you'd have won that one pretty quick. Just do just do circles and I'll get tired, okay? Yeah. I appreciate the voice, um, yeah, wonderful. So, gra- so glad to have a third voice in here. Um, I'll also remind you, if you want to hear more of our voices, make sure you're subscribed to our Substack, royalsweekly.substack.com. We're coming out with content all the time. Some of it's written. I, I posted a thing yesterday, or no, this morning, this morning uh, on uh, various things happening to the Royals. We do a weekly midweek episode every week just for our subscribers on Substack, our paid subscribers. They're loving it. We're getting into some weird stuff. Mike, it's a lot different doing the midweek episodes with no ads. I feel like we get deeper into a lot of real baseball stuff stuff uh mm-hmm. with that one so if, if you're interested go ahead and subscribe to the royals weekly substack uh royalsweekly.substack.com but also pay attention to our sponsors like nap family wealth we are brought to you by nap family wealth mike can you think of anything more important than securing your financial future that feeling you get when you successfully tear something right on the crease yeah. crisp yeah that is nice, but uh, no. Mm-hmm. Securing your financial future is one of the most important steps someone can take for themselves and their family, and Nat Family Wealth is ready to help you pursue it. This isn't some big, faceless corporation we're talking about here. Nat Family Wealth is run by J.C. Knapp. He's a huge baseball fan, and he's been helping people plan for their financial future for 20 years. He can help with retirement planning so you don't have to work until you're dead, education planning so your kids learn to read good, investment management so you get all that money from out of your mattress and get it working for you. Don't spend another day thinking you've got it all figured out, because trust me, you don't. Check out Nap Family Wealth at napfamilywealth.com. That's K N A P P familywealth.com. Securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor, member FINRA slash SIPC. We'll start the review with was- roster news like we always do. And there is actually a ton of it. Uh, in fact, some of it just came out today and is a little bit sad. Uh, Annie Rogers reported like a couple hours ago that Michael Waka has a finger contusion is what they're calling it for now after being hit by a line drive in an inter-squad game. We don't really know anything about it. He's going to get x-rays until then. We're sort of, everything's sort of up in the air, but I wanted to ask you two, your thoughts on the notion of losing a guy we were really counting on in the rotation right before the season started. Mike, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, it depends on what it is. If it is actually just a finger contusion, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Maybe you skip his first start and figure out something there. But if this is a broken finger, he's going to be down for a little while. And I don't know how you fill that spot. I guess if it's a broken finger, you can probably count on him after about six to eight weeks. And maybe you cut and paste and spit this thing together until he gets back but it's definitely not the place you want to be with a guy that you paid big money and was supposed to be the stabilizing force so that what happened last year doesn't happen again. Now it just looks like what happened last year is happening again, which sucks. Yeah. The the Royals don't have any depth there, right? I mean, if I've, I've mentioned it on Twitter, the only way this season goes according to plan, unfortunately requires Lugo and Waka and Reagan's and singer to be healthy and productive. 
if Waka misses significant time, you got to go get Daniel Lynch out of the minor leagues, probably, who you just sent down to because he wasn't good enough, right? And I, I just that is that would be like the epitome of the snowball rolling downhill to start opening day is the guy you paid big money to, not even on the opening day roster because he's on the IL. By the way, can the Royals not afford an L screen? Can we get these guys <laughs> something to hide behind? It's an inner squad. I get if it was a spring training game, but you guys are playing an inner squad. Get these guys some something to hide behind when they throw the pitch. There's no reason for there to be any pitchers getting hit by any projectiles this close to opening day. Get them in bubble wrap and get them to Kansas City. How is this happening? Yeah, that's going to be a question on a lot of people's mind is how do you let this happen four days before you you open? You know, like that's like, you know, you would think that they are like wrapped in bubble wrap, you know, behind three security guards. Just n- nothing could ever touch any of these pitchers, especially for them, because as you mentioned, Alex, they are even with the additions that they've made, their depth in the starting rotation is not great. And so the thing that I'm wondering is where do they go? You mentioned Lynch. They could turn to Lynch if they wanted to. Lyles is, of course, there. They had mentioned him as, you know, part of the fifth starter conversation. He looked like he was the, the, the leading it, you know, to going into the spring. And then you have questions. Do they do something like an opener and then Zerpa? You know, that's another one of those options, like taping it together. The hard part for this is if you're a Royals fan is they're taping together a rotation in what might be the hardest stretch of their schedule right at the beginning of the season. Right. And so you really hate to see that sort of thing when they haven't even you know thrown a pitch yet. And when they're going to be facing Baltimore twice and Toronto twice and, you know, Houston Twins and Houston and these really good teams, they're going to go into it down one of their probably top two, if not top three starters. That's going to be a, a difficult stretch here. Let's hope it's just a contusion. Let's hope it's uh, it's as sunny as they think it is, but we don't we don't know yet. And on top of that, Waka Waka might have been the best looking pitcher at the end of spring training starter that they had coming out of spring training. So that's a extra kick to the pills. Yeah, another roster a sort of move that changes the complexion a little bit now that uh, Waka might be hurt. The Royals selected Alec Marsh to be part of the rotation over Jordan Lyles uh, to fill that fifth starter role. So both Alec Marsh and Jordan Lyles have made the ro- the roster, but Marsh will be a starter. We'll see if Lyles becomes a starter after this Waka thing. But what are your guys' thoughts on them choosing Marsh over Lyles initially in this roster? I like it. You know, I'm I'm excited about it. There is some risk, obviously, because... Anything, and you and I have talked about this quite a bit, Mark, I think the things you're looking for in a four and five starter are guys who are going to consistently keep you in games. And Marsh does have the home run risk that can take you out of games pretty quickly. But he also has that ability to get the strikeout. And so you kind of weigh your options there. Okay, we're going to go with the guy who we feel like might have taken a step forward with this stuff this summer or this winter, I mean, and hope that the home runs don't come to bite him and he gives up big innings early on in starts. Uh, if he can do that, if he can limit the home run, I feel like you've got a, a solid five starter in Alec Marsh plus friend of the show. We always want good things. If if Alex Duvall becomes a pitching coach for the Royals, we're gonna we're gonna be pumping that too. All right, so you know that's that's uh, always great things. Yeah, I don't know about all that, but <laughs> <laughs> this was absolutely the right move. I mean, the only the only way the Royals make the playoffs this year is if a few guys you don't expect step up and have great seasons. Jordan Lyles is incapable of that. I, I think last year proved it. He's not going to be a above average starter ever again. Alec Marsh, if you told me this year he is, you know, if there were 150 MLB starters with X amount of innings and he was the 74th best one, I could buy that. I could buy Alec Marsh being a just slightly above average MLB starter for a few seasons on his rookie contract. And that's the type of guy you need to have a big year if you really want to make the playoffs. And Jordan Lyles, by the way, still has some stuff that's intriguing. And the only way to recoup any value right now is in the bullpen. So if he goes to the bullpen and looks okay, somebody might come calling for him at the deadline, maybe. And if they don't, that's fine. Maybe he gives you some good innings in the bullpen. But there's no upside to Jordan Lyles in your rotation anymore. And with Alec Marsh, there's a lot of upside. There's a lot of downside, but there's a lot of upside. I mean, maybe he puts, uh, you know, a random season together where he's John Gray. Uh, Maybe he puts a random season together like um, oh, Julio Tehran puts together for Atlanta a few years ago, where 
you know, it's it's probably not sustainable, but hey, that's definitely playable. Um, who was the big guy in Detroit that? Uh, Scoobal? Yeah. No, no. The, the, Fulmer? The big, Fulmer. Michael Fulmer put together yeah. a few good big league seasons with dynamic stuff that clearly was not sustainable. We saw Brad Keller do it, but Alec Marsh has stuff that's that's on that level. And if he puts together one or two of those good seasons and your MLB team has a shot at making the playoffs. Alex, quick question for you. Do you think this could be like an Ian Kennedy transition from that for starting Miles? rotation into the, yeah. Yeah. Into I, the bullpen. I, and I think the, the difference between Kennedy is he wasn't that bad, right? When he, when he yeah. was taken out of the rotation, I mean, Jordan Lyles last year was literally, I think if I remember correctly, the worst starter. The worst in Major League Baseball by far. Uh, Ian Kennedy wasn't that bad. Um, so I don't know that Jordan Lyles has like a, a future in the, in a bullpen, but if he has a future, it is in the bullpen. So no time like the present to find out. Right. And even if he gives you like nothing but average innings or even be- slightly below average innings, I'll take 100 slightly below average innings. Then I'll take, you know, 180 way below average innings, right? which is what he gave last year. And so, you know, I think the possibility of having him throw shorter stretches means you get a little bit more of that quality. So he only goes a hundred innings, but maybe that you know, I'll take, you know, a hundred of league average or slightly below from him. If we can get that. I do think we need to press a little bit of the caution button with Marsh. I know there's a lot of hype out there right now because of what he's done in spring training. And yes, he was very good in spring training, but you still saw some of the stuff that gave you concerns last year. Like it's not like he didn't give up any home runs in spring training. He gave up three or four home runs. It's not like he didn't walk anybody. He walked, some guys, you know, like, and so, you know, if you're thinking about, yes, some of his stuff looked better. Yes. Some of his command looked better with that stuff. And yes, it looks like maybe they have a better idea of what kind of pitch mix they want for him this year. But my expectation is going to be, Hey, come out and be that fifth starter type who keeps us in enough games. And if the expectation goes beyond that, if he ends up becoming looking more like a mid rotation guy or being above major league average, then all the better. But I want to keep our expectations just a little bit managed for him. Oh yeah. No, and and that's why I say he's he's got some downside. Like he has the potential to be just about as bad as Lyles. Like that's certainly in his realm of outcomes, but his upside is just trem- he actually has some, right? <laughs> way way above that. <laughs> way way above <laughs> Lyles. If Lyles is 10% outcome is what he did last year, something like 6.25, his 90th out percentile outcome is what 4.15 as an ERA, that's the best he could ever possibly do probably. Whereas Marsh, if he has a really good year and just jumps out of his skin or something, a three, seven, five isn't outside the realm of possibility for somebody like him. Um, The roster decision that I feel like got the most heat and got the most sort of blood boiling for some people was uh, Velasquez over Prado. The Royals chose to keep Nelson Velasquez on the roster and send uh, Nick Prado down to AAA, despite the fact that Nelson Velasquez's numbers in spring did not look good and Prado's looked otherworldly. Mike, what are your thoughts on their decision to roster Velasquez and send Prado to Omaha to start the season? Well, I think this is where the idea that the numbers of spring training probably don't match the eyes of spring training. If you and I said this over and over again in those last two or three weeks of spring training, We said, if you watch what Nelson Velasquez is doing, you're seeing positive things. You're seeing good approach at the plate. You're seeing him walk. He's just not getting the hits that he's going to get during the season. And so that's the thing that you kind of have to pay attention for. Prado, I think the new approach is real. I think he's improved. I think he's more aggressive overall, but especially in two strike counts. But he's done it for 40 plate appearances or something in spring training get to triple a and do it for a month and show us all that you deserve to be up here from the beginning. We can't take Nelson Velasquez out of this lineup. If he can still do what he did last year, which he certainly can, in my opinion. So I I'm on a whole wholeheartedly on board with it. I completely agree with keeping Velasquez over Prado the, and I'll get to the point here. If I would have put Prado on the roster, it would have been in a different way than this. Okay. So I disagree like wholeheartedly with almost everything you just said. Okay. Good. We like, we lost conflict on this podcast. We want to to create that. We're about to fight. We're going straight up uh, Jerry Springer here in a second. All right. (laughs) So here's my thing. Let's, let's start with Prado is by doing this, 
the Royals can never say again, which they did, by the way, with Lynch. Like, there's an open competition for a roster spot. No, there's not. You already had your mind made up. This is literally as far apart as you could possibly get in spring training performance. Prado was literally your best hitter all spring, and Nelson Velasquez was literally your worst hitter all spring in terms of performance. So if there was any competition whatsoever coming into this spring, it would have been Prado, bar none, not close. So there was never a competition for that. Prado was always going to AAA. As a player, that pisses you off. That would piss me off beyond all measure, right? It'd be one thing if it was close and Prado was a little bit better or maybe just a lot better. It is drastic how much better he was than Velasquez all spring, right? So there's that aspect of it. I'm not even saying I disagree with it. I'm just saying you can no longer say there's open competition ever again because you just told us the competition in spring does not matter. We've got our decision made up, and you can go play in the spring, get ready, but there is no more competition. You have thrown that out the window. You can no longer say that. And I, the I think they should – oh, no, go ahead. Keep. Sorry, my bad, Alex. No, no, last point about Velasquez. I like Velasquez. I think they made the right decision. I wouldn't pay attention to spring training stats. I just want to be clear about what they said and what they can no longer say. But also, Nelson Velasquez cannot do what he did last year again this year. Agreed. A third third of his fly balls left the yard. That is not sustainable. A 350 ISO is not sustainable. So even if he comes back to earth and, you know, hits for an average amount of power for a guy like him. So let's say he's in the like the 75th percentile, 80th percentile and in the, in the major league baseball and, and ISO, you know, you're still talking about a fairly productive hitter. Um, but the flexibility of having Prado being able to play the same positions as Velasquez and first base to me was made it even closer. Um, I, I don't really know what Velasquez is. I saw your, we're going to get to it. The over under you've got for Velasquez and home runs, I thought was absurdly high. So I guess we're getting ready to see where everybody's at on Velasquez. I'm not there, but I don't also disagree with the move. It's just the way it was presented where I was like, okay, whoa, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I actually, I agree with that 100%. I think I said this on maybe our midweek episode, like, it never was an open competition. They should not have told Prado it was an open competition. You can see it very clearly when you compare that situation to the Lyles um, Marsh situation that that was an open competition and Lyles lost and Marsh won. And so Marsh gets to be the fifth starter. Now, what I find interesting is if you're going to say it's an open competition, do it with some guy who was terrible last year, right? It should be an open competition for dudes who were terrible last year. Nelson Velasquez was not terrible last year. He was really, really good. And so the notion that they came in and they and they were like, oh, you know, it's an open competition. Well, it shouldn't have been for Nelson Velasquez. He proved himself and earned that spot last year. Like, don't, don't take that out. Like, don't be like, oh, Prado, you have a shot because, you know, of something. But he doesn't. Like, so don't lie to him. That disingenuineness is ultimately going to come back to bite you. What bothers me about the whole situation is there is a like army of people who started spring trading by saying, don't worry about spring training results. Don't think about spring spring training performance. And then Prado played really well and Velasquez didn't. And they were like, Prado over Velasquez. And it's like, you cannot just admit to yourself that you are making that decision on the basis of spring training performance and spring training performance only, because that's what you're doing. Right? Like that is what you are doing. It is intellectually dishonest, but that's what you're doing. Okay. If, if we're not thinking about only spring training results, then that job goes to Velasquez because he's the one who's done it in a larger sample size in actual competition. And so like, ultimately it may not matter. Maybe if we had our preference, both would be on the roster or something like that, but I want some intellectual honesty. And if we're going to say down with spring training results, stop making evaluations based on them. I'm going to stick with that and not make an evaluation on that. 
Another one that I find very interesting of a roster move, and this is one that was kind of expected, but I had to put it in here because I really wanted to talk about Dyron Blanco. Uh, Dyron Blanco makes it for what I would call the last roster spot, basically, as a fourth outfielder over Drew Waters. Drew Waters is sent to AAA. What are your guys' thoughts on the value of someone like Blanco versus Waters and whether or not one should have made the roster versus the other? I think, I think... When you talk about a fourth outfielder spot, you're looking for a guy like Tyron Blanco, who has not only proven that he can fill that spot extremely, extremely well last year, he also gives you some consistency that Drew Waters has never been able to give you. And Waters came out and he hit, especially in the early part of spring training. He looked pretty good, but there wasn't anything that said that Drew Waters is a different hitter from what he's always been, right? He's... Right now, he's on one of the hot Drew Waters streaks for spring training. But what happens when he gets into one of those valleys? We're going to go two or three weeks without anything out of our seven, eight, or nine hitter. Like, that can't happen. You know, especially for a guy you're coming in, you're going to ask to come in and play once or twice a week and then come in late in games. You've got to, one, have somebody who you you like playing center, and two, somebody who's going to be able to go up there and give you a competent at bat and not strike out on three pitches. And Dyron Blanco is going to do that for you. And so, uh, yeah, you and I have been calling the Blanco over Waters thing since spring training started. And so I, I feel like it's a that's a dummy move to me. That's a that's a no brainer. This was, I think, Waters going down is the emergence of Velasquez last year is Velasquez stole that right field slash extra outfielder job. And I think Isbell is clearly the center fielder. MJ is clearly the left fielder or right, whatever, right. Um, in one of the corners, I think Velasquez last year stole a job from Drew Waters. And Drew Waters, by the way, this spring is exactly what you think Drew Waters is. Walk rate around 10%, strikeout rate around 37, ISO at 170, a 112 weighted runs creative. I mean, that is Drew Waters to a T, like, right? I mean, he was exactly who we thought he was. Um, and, and Mike, you could not have said it any better. He didn't do anything different. He didn't do anything to suggest that he had made a change. And it was just kind of same old, same old. And with Nelson Velasquez, you know, I, if we're going to throw spring training stats out the window, then he, he won the job last year. If you wanted to bring him in, Nelson Velasquez would be the last guy on the big league roster. So it's, it's, it's all context. It's all nuance. But I think Drew Waters lost this job when Nelson Velasquez hit 17 home runs last year. Yeah. Uh, And I love that you mentioned, Mike, that Blanco is the type of guy who's going to fill some of those fourth outfielder needs a little bit better. Andy Rogers posted a story earlier today talking about Lofton and Blanco and all those guys who sort of made the the roster at the very end there. And she got a quote from, I want to say Matt Quattrero or someone who was just talking about the ways in which he, one, can play on like, after not playing for a while, he can come in and re- and sit two or three days and then just pop into the game when he's needed and be right there, 100 percent ready to go and all that sort of stuff. That does take a certain type of player, a certain type of personality. And Blanco, who's played a lot of professional baseball in his life, even though he's only been in the majors for half a season, you're there in your mind. Mentally, you know what you're doing. And so I think that makes a whole lot of sense as a as an a. Uh, you know, as an addition, maybe Waters goes down to AAA and finally learns how to stop striking out. I didn't know that 37% number, Alex, before you said it. And I'm like, that's in spring training. Some of the guys he's facing are double A pitchers. Like 37% is just not, I know that the stats don't matter there, but if you can't strike out less than that in spring training, you're in trouble. And so you're going to have to show it at AAA at the very least. The next guy I know. Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry, let me clarify. I brought up Velasquez when you guys were talking about Blanco. I still think Waters is a guy who needs to play every day. And so you're what he's really competing with Velasquez for everyday big league at bats, where Blanco is going to, like you said, play every three days. Um, So that's that's probably why Waters and Prado both go down instead of Blanco to, to play every day, right? So I that's why I brought up Velasquez, but. Yeah, that makes sense. And Blanco is the type of guy who you don't worry about developmentally because he's already, he's, this is age 31 season. And, you know, right. it's a guy who's like, there nobody has really fit the fourth outfielder role better than him at this point. And so, yeah, great. Go with him. Uh, Alex, I know you're excited to talk about this next guy because he's like your boy. Uh, and so one of the, I guess, surprises, it's not really, it wasn't that much of a surprise because Massey kept not playing in games and we kept saying like, well, he's not ready yet. He's not ready yet. Uh, Nick Lofton makes the roster. 
and Michael Massey is expected to be put on the injured list when the season opens. What are your guys' thoughts on the notion of Lofton making it and Massey headed to the IL? Well, this is actually the spot where I would have put Prado. I, if I was going to keep somebody down, it would have been Nick Lofton and put Prado up there. Now, not that's nothing against Nick Lofton. I like him as a player, and he's played really well this spring. Um, and I get that he provides the versatility. But we already have Adam Frazier. We're already keeping Garrett Hampson, and we have Michael Garcia. I think we pretty much have everything covered there. Blanco can play center if you need a backup center fielder. Even Hampson can play center if you need a backup center fielder. I mean, I feel like those guys provide the versatility you need without Nick Lofton. If you were, were going to reward somebody for having a top-notch spring training, I feel like this is where Prado would have gotten in, not Lofton. It's not like Lofton has proven a whole bunch of stuff at the major league level, although he had a decent year last year. Um, I just think this would have been the spot to to put Prado in there. But, you know, more power to Nick Lofton. He went out there. He's done well. He's progressed a little bit from last year. He can play multiple positions. I'm excited to see what he can do. Part of me kind of hates that he's not going to be playing every day. I'll be honest there. Um, I don't like guys coming up here and sitting, but, you know, if he can provide value for the team, more power to him. Yeah, this was, you know, <clears throat> why I hated the Garrett Hampson signing so much is Nick Lofton was very good last year, 18% better than league average offensively. He comes out this spring absolutely on fire. I mean, that ball he hit, like the, the things you have to judge in spring training, you know, not that he hit a home run. It's, okay, where did he hit it? How hard did he hit it? Because the the ball down there flies, right? That ball he hit, the home run he hit the right center, was absolutely blistered to the opposite field. And who knows what the pitcher was working on. Maybe he gave him a meatball and Nick Lofton knew it was coming, but – I mean, he he showed an upside this spring, I think, that maybe not everybody realized he had. And I think the thing with Lofton is people with prospects are always looking for your next all-star. The problem with prospects a lot of times isn't their upside. It's, well, what do they turn into when they're not playing well? I'm just talking about that with Alec Marsh. Alec Marsh has, you know, top half of the big league starters potential in him. He also has Jordan Lyles in him. Nick Lofton, the worst player he's going to be is Michael Garcia last year. I mean, just yeah. a really good defender and a serviceable bat that gets on base. Mark Grudzelonic. Yeah, just don't screw up, right? I mean, he is a really, really solid player that you need a lot of. Like, you need guys like Nick Lofton in your lineup. And if he loses playing time to Adam Frazier, Adam Frazier's a name. I could see him getting some trade interest and – whatever, but if he loses time to Garrett Hampson, I'm going to be f freaking furious. Like what? I know you think you're going to be good, but we still got to develop the young guys because you're probably not going to be as good as you think like you are. Like we still have to get these young guys playing time. And so I can appreciate sending Prado down. If you don't think he's going to play, like I, I get it. Send him down to AAA where he can play every day, but Lofton has been really good and Lofton needs to play darn near every day he's been that good he needs to play a lot of baseball five days out of every seven because what i saw from nick lofts in the spring is every bit of an average every day second baseman in major league baseball because he provides you the ability to play third base and left field and apparently first base it was good enough at first base to send prado to the minor leagues so I just, you know, we'll see what, what his playing time looks like, but I could not be more impressed in any capacity with Nick Lofton. I mean, he's, he was just about perfect this spring. Yeah, I just cannot imagine a coaching staff knowing what they're doing and putting Adam Frazier and Garrett Hampson at second base more than, than Nick Lofton. Because it's not just the play the young guys thing or the, you know, they need to develop. Nick Lofton is the better offensive option than both of those guys right now. Like he gives you a better chance to, he probably gives you a better chance to win than both of those players right now. And so, yeah, I can't be in agreement more with you there, Alex. He's got to play four to five days minimum uh, in every week. And so, yeah, I'm curious to see though, if he does do well, if he continues what he's been doing in spring and just carries. And the thing that I've been most impressed about with him this spring is that he's taking more walks. So we know he's a guy who doesn't strike out a ton, but he's taken a few walks this spring. And that encourages me a little bit there, right? Like if he can add to that walk total from last year, I'll be even more impressed uh, than I was with what I've seen from him in, in, in years past. But what happens is my question. If Nick Lofton goes off to start the year, 
what happens if he carries over his hot spring? Is Michael Massey going to get Wally pipped? Is this like a, <laughs> because <laughs> Massey was up and down last year. He had the atrocious start to the season. We know that he can get into these stretches where he's not taking great plate appearances. We know he's prone to probably more strikeouts than you would want somebody to be prone to it. Uh, that who's got his offensive profile. And so what happens if Lofton goes off? Does, does Massey get that spot back? Are they more like cautious quote unquote with him coming back from the injury? I don't know. I'll be very curious to see what happens because if he's going off, do you like send Nick Lofton back down and then keep Garrett Hansen and Adam Frazier? That seems insane to me, but you know, it's a possibility. (laughs) If they, if, if, if Nick Lofton is hitting, and they send him down, like if he's hitting well, and they send him down in favor of Garrett Hampson, I promise I will come back on this show and do an entire shirt or do an entire show in a clown suit with makeup, <laughs> hair, <laughs> nose, and, JJ and a big Piccolo. JJ Piccolo. <laughs> <laughs> We're holding you to that. We are yeah. holding you to that. We'll do it just for the clicks. We're all about the clicks here at Royals Weekly, and so uh, yeah, we're holding you to clown suits. Um, <laughs> Deal. Let's get into the review of last week because we're already te- like halfway through the show, sort of. This is going to be the longest episode ever. Uh, the Royals <laughs> went 0-3-3 and last week on the field, which is weird, right? Like they had three ties and they lost their games. They went winless, but they did get three ties, which is, I guess, okay. Very soccer uh, of them. Very soccer. <laughs> this is a European team. For the most part. Yes, three points. Uh, Alex knows soccer. Uh, who did you guys have for strong performers last week? All right, I'm going with a non-strong performer, strong performer, because it's spring training. Uh, Andrew Hoffman. <laughs> I watched the game that Andrew Hoffman started, and he wasn't all that strong. Like, he, he didn't do terrible or anything, but two and, two, uh, two and two-thirds innings, five hits, one K, uh, one earned run, no walks. But the reason I wanted to talk about him is because, and I think Alex actually mentioned this last year, he looks like a completely different pitcher than what he was when the Royals got him. He does not even look, I mean, it looks like a different human being. His fastball is about 50 times better than what it was when we got him. And it's, I'd never seen it. Like I, I think I heard you mention it, Alex on Twitter or something. Um, but I'd never seen it. And I'm going, my gosh, his fastball might be his best pitch now. (laughs) And it was terrible. I mean, it wasn't very good before. And so I think he needs to tighten up some of the, especially the command on the breaking stuff. And I think he needs to improve some of the, uh, some of the movement on the breaking stuff, but I could see him getting a major start in major league baseball at some point in his life uh, where, you know, and maybe even becoming a back end guy. Now I would have never thought that a couple of years ago. So, and that maybe that's more of a Testament to the organization and his willingness to change and stuff. But uh, wow, he looks like a different guy to me. And that was cool to see. I think he needs to tighten up his cap. Dude has trouble keeping. I know his he keeps on. falling off. I saw that. I <laughs> Got that hippie hair, here? man. It wasn't just this start either. The last start, I swear <laughs> to God, it fell off the in every pitch he threw in the first inning. Every one of them. <laughs> and so, yeah, Hoffman looks good, but you know, keep your hat on. Alex, who you got for a strong performer? How about Dyron Blanco? He did not actually yeah. have that good of a week. But he made the opening day roster. I mean, how many? Is he is he thirty one yet? He's about to be thirty one no. years old. Yeah, he's about just to just made an opening day roster for the first time in your life. Like this is very like Paulo Orlando ish, where Paulo Orlando came up just to fill in, played kind of well, and they're like, okay, well, let's see what else he's got. And then all of a sudden, he's getting regular reps for a World Series team. Like, dude, like why not, man? Like, like let's go, Dyron Blanco. Like again, he didn't have that great of a week, but. How about your first opening day? Like that is that is so cool. And that's why really I feel so bad for Massey. Like Massey was in the same boat. Like he made the opening day roster and then he gets hurt. It's like, oh, like I feel so bad for those guys. Like I don't think people realize, by the way, how cool that is. Like I've I've talked to several people who've made their big league debuts, and they and a lot of them will say, you know, my big league debut was cool, but if the team's not doing well you'll hear a lot of guys say that their first opening day roster assignment was cooler than their debut. Like it's, it's the vibe, it's the energy, it's the excitement. And you're on the roster that everybody believes in, right? Or at least used to, it used to be that idea <laughs> that everybody thought they could win on opening day. Um, so I don't know, man, good for Dyron Blanco. That's cool. 
It is even spe especially special for Blanco. I mean, Massey, he'll have other opening day experiences. Blanco, this might be his only one. You don't, you really don't know when a guy's 31 years old how much time he's got left in the big leagues, you know, and it took him so long to get to Major League Baseball and then to get to the big leagues. That's so good for him. Good for you, Dyron Blanco. That's why Royals Weekly is always in your corner, buddy. Uh, I'm talking about Nick Lofton, both because he made the team, so congratulations to him, but also he had a good week offensively this week. He went five for 14, one home run, two walks, two strikeouts, and we just got a good chance to take a look and see why people are so hyped about him. And Alex brought up that home run that he hit to right center. I think everybody saw that and was like, okay, maybe we need to start thinking about Nick Lofton in a different kind of way. Maybe we need to start being like, Alex, I don't know if you remember this, but when Nick Lofton was drafted, I made this prediction and I kept sort of repeating it to everyone. Nick Lofton will hit 15 home runs in the major leagues one day. I think he's going to do it. I think he's got the power. If he gets everyday playing time, he's definitely going to do it. Um, so yeah, excited to see Nick Lofton. Uh, hopefully he can uh, hit the ground running here in uh, three or four days. Wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. Who had weak performances for us? Mike, go. I'm a little bit concerned with Brady Singer, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you and everyone else in Kansas yeah. City. <laughs> um, 4.2 innings pitch, eight hits, three walks, three Ks, seven earned runs. We got a chance to see him twice when we were in Arizona. Didn't really impress either time. Um Gosh, you know, you were excited about the addition of the new pitches, the sweeper, the four-seamer, but the velocity is still down on the two-seamer. The location of the slider still not, when it's not there, he gets the shit hit out of him. I mean, he that day we were in, now granted it was cold, it was raining. Or no, that wasn't even the day that that happened. The day we saw, the first day we were there, we saw him at Ho-Ho Cam. He, he gave up more hard hit line drives in an inning than I've seen in a long time. One that almost killed him. And, uh, it was, it was unreal. Like he's getting hit hard, man. And I don't know, like you, and, and I, th Alex, actually, I think I said this on the show. And then before the show actually came out, I went on Twitter and I think you said the, ex the exact same thing. He's the X factor in this rotation. And I said it, uh, in our midweek episode, I think last week, um, he, I think he's the, the turning point. And right now it doesn't look like it's turning in the right direction. You know, Spencer Strider led the world and strikeouts last year. You know what he mm -hmm. added to his arsenal this year? Curveball. Oh, Change another up. Another pitch. Oh, yeah. Another <laughs> pitch. Like, Brady Singer, for how many years, wouldn't do it? And the major league leader in strikeouts last year is like, oh, I wonder if I could be better. Yeah. Coachability, am I right? Says everything. That says everything, honestly. Like, and it wasn't just him. I mean, Somebody, uh, one of the Royals pitching coaches, that the, the guys they just hired from Tread or Driveline, I can't remember his name. I think he'll be in Double A this year. Um, if you read his Twitter bio, it just has the line, um, uh, oh, I forget. It's something along the lines of like, uh, if it ain't broke, make it better, right? Like that. That's what it says, and it's like, yes, that is it. Everybody in pitching in Major League Baseball right now, the attitude has changed from like, don't change anything if it's going well, to even if it's going well, get better. <laughs> and Brady Singer for a while there was, even though it's going terribly, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And now we're seeing like, because even if that fastball sweeper, those added pitches are in some way helping him, it's going to take time to like incorporate them into Major League Baseball and get comfortable throwing them to Major League hitters. Like it's not, oh, I just snapped my fingers. Now I can throw two new pitches and be really good at it. Like, no, it's going to take time. Hopefully he can keep that sinker slider combo going pretty well as he incorporates them. But there might be some rough days out there for Brady Singer still. Uh, along those lines, my weak performer was Daniel Lynch. I mean, what a massive blown lead. He was up 28 to three in the second half for the fifth rotation spot and blew it. <laughs> he looked horrible this spring. And I know he's coming off of injury, but dude, like, I, you know, I was early on, I was not on the Daniel Lynch bandwagon. And I kind of came around thinking that the off speed stuff would play. He needs to scrap whatever he thinks his fastball is and find a new one. It's horrible. We've and, been calling for a cutter for uh, two years from him. <laughs> dude, I don't, I don't know. I don't, and again, I don't know, like with Daniel Lynch, it seems like he's always been willing to try to add new stuff and do things differently, unlike Singer, right? So this isn't necessarily about him and his his approach to the game, but my goodness gracious, I mean, I really thought he was going to be, this was going to be his year. He'd come out, he'd be healthy, he'd have some, some, some you know, 
time to recalibrate what he thought he was on the mound. And it was same old Daniel Lynch. I remember I, I text David Lesky in the middle of one of his starts. I'm like, oh, this looks familiar. I mean, this is the same guy. Nothing has changed about anything he's doing. And it's like at some point, I get it. You got there. And, and that's great, man. Like, good for you. But, like, we've we've got to be more, you know, adept to, to change, more comfortable with, with improving. And it just seems like some of these guys, the Royals have, have – brought in to through the draft have just that's a story as old as time I guess yeah with Lynch I see I'm the opposite Alex I've gotten the vibe from him for the last two years that he was either unwilling to change or unwilling to acknowledge that there was a problem right and so like we've seen the Annie Rogers piece that looks identical at the start of both of these spring trainings where she asks him what are you working on and she even asks, are you adding any new pitches? And he says, no. And it's like, well, here's the thing, man. If you don't acknowledge at some point, if I don't see a quote from you that says, my fastball isn't any good, then I know that you don't know what the actual problem is. Remember that you guys know the scene from Moneyball. What's the problem? No, what's the problem, right? This is the problem. Your fastball sucks. That's the problem, okay? If he doesn't acknowledge that and try and fix it, we're nowhere. We're, we're same old Daniel Lynch where, okay, your ceiling is a four and a half ERA, right? And, you know, we'll see if you can stay healthy. That's like, so that's Daniel Lynch for you right there in a nutshell. And so it's like, until you change that, until you acknowledge that you have problems with your arsenal, that's where you are. And that's never going to change. Just to uh, recap for the listeners here, last year at the beginning of the year, that was an article from Andy Rogers that said, where Daniel Lynch says, oh, well, I'm working on this breaking pitch or I'm working on this. I'm working to get my my slider to break a little bit more when everybody's when Mark and I were going, nope, that's wrong. Don't you don't need that. That's not it. That's wrong. And then this year it was, oh, I got bigger and I got, you know, I, I've been, I worked on so I could stay healthy. That's great. What are you doing for your fastball? That's all. Like, that's all. That's all we care about. What are you doing to improve that pitch? And so far, it hasn't looked like anything's really moved forward. Let's what a draft pose. class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a Let's draft suppose, class. Hey, I think was was Nick Loft in that draft class? No. No, he's not that draft class. Uh no. let's just suppose that with my guy, my weak performer for this week. A guy who I put on here, but I'm sure none of us are worried about. Cole Reggins was my weak performer for the week. He had four innings pitched, five earned runs, five strikeouts, three walks. But none of us are like, oh no, sound the alarm bells, or at least I'm not, because Reggins came in this year and somehow in some ways looked even better than he did last year. He came in pumping 98 to 101 to start spring training. And it was clear, oh, this off season, even though he was really good last year, he worked to improve his fastball because his fastball, while good, was an average pitch for him last year, right? He came in and clearly tried to make it even better, right? Like now, this is why someone like Cole Reagans will have a chance to be the Royals opening day starter and Daniel Lynch is will be the opening starter in Omaha, right? Like those, that's sort of the big difference there, right? Let's talk about themes. Alex didn't stick with our, with our, uh, with our, uh, he's a noob. It. He's noob. a noob. He's a noob. Alex, <laughs> we do themes now by uh, movie quotes, TV quotes, music quotes, that sort of thing. But you can go with yours either way. Uh, Mike, what is your theme for this week? Uh, from the classic ending of the bar uh, song from Semisonic Closing Time, it's uh, every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. As we are starting our new beginning into the new season, and ending our new beginning of spring training, it's time to get started. It's time for the games to matter, and I'm ready for it. Was not ready, ready for the walking news today emotionally, but that's okay. Um, but no, I'm ready for that beginning to end, and I'm ready for the new one to start. Alex, I see you quickly looking up music and movie quotes. You want to give you? You want to do mine so you can have a, yeah, you can have go, a second? Okay, give, give me yours, and I'll see if I can find something that fits my theme here. So at first, I was like thinking of all the movies and music I know, and I'm like, okay, I have an idea of what I want this to be. But here's the thing: I only like good movies and music and television. I think everybody knows that. <laughs> uh, the problem is the thing that came to my mind. I can only think of one song, and it's, it's, it's a, not it's a, a classic, movie. though. It's a classic, but it's not good, right? Like, and you so my theme for this week is. Let's get it started, ya. Yeah. Let's get it started in here. <laughs> Black Eyed Peas. Just a classic. Black Eyed Peas. Just a classic. Thought you were going right? so, to go with Lady Humps, but that's okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Next time. <laughs> Next time we're going with Lady Humps. But... <laughs> Yeah, I'm just, uh, I, I was thinking about the next four days, which to me are going to be very hard days, like three days, basically with no baseball 
until opening day is tough because I'm ready to go. I'm ja- I'm jazzed. I'm I'm through with spring training and I'm ready to kick it off. You know, like. But uh, you know, so I'm pumped with that's that's a good pumped party song, or it was back in the early 2000s. Let's get it started, yeah. Let's get it started in here. Alex, what did you come up with in your frantic search for a theme? You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't Ooh. fool all the people all the time. Yeah, and I think that's right back where we are with the Royals. It is the same. It, this is going to be the exact same team a little bit improved. It is a bad collection of veterans and a mismanaged group of young guys that I am like not that optimistic about in the grand scheme of things compared to others. So you can fool some people, but you can't fool us all. I I think this is going to be a disappointing level of the same thing. Again, it'll be better, but the same process, the same, way of going about business, um, but it'll be better. This should be more fun to watch. And again, I think there's at least a shot that in August, they're within six or seven games of the Twins, which is fun. That's fun because that on any given night, that falls to five and then four, and now you're a series away, right? If you can get it down to three or four at any point in August, you're one series away. And do they, do they play – let me look at their schedule because I think I was looking – I think they play the Twins in early September. And if that's correct, their schedule is right here. Let's scroll to the end of the year. Yep, September 6th, 7th, and 8th. So the first weekend of September, you open with the Minnesota Twins. If you can get it to six games by then, you sweep That's them exciting. Yeah. yeah, it's exciting. You play for the AL Central. Ballpark. You know, that the K will be packed. People will be wondering why we're leaving. <laughs> you had to bring it up. We've been trying to avoid that topic for like a month. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, no, the great, great point that you make there, too. I think even though I, I completely agree, like fool me once, say, you know, all that stuff. But the great thing about this team, even though they're likely to be like a 70 win team again, or, a, you know, we would have killed for 70 wins last year, I guess. But even though they're likely not to win more than 80 games, we have two superstars. We have Bobby Witt Jr. and we have Cole Reagans. Like we, we have two legit superstars that we can cheer for on every day. And, and that's at least a step in the right direction, I think. And I think that we might be looking back on this year as the year that MJ Melendez took a big step forward, too. So, um yeah, I agree. I don't think they're going to win the AL Central, but I do think this year offers a lot more to watch. Royals Weekly is brought to you by Eric Oksher of West USA Realty. Phoenix has all of our favorite things, year-round golf, year-round baseball, and Eric Oksher of West USA Realty. Whether you want to buy your dream retirement home or just stay a while and catch spring training, Eric can help you find the perfect house for you. We've known him for more than 30 years and trust him far more than we even trust each other. Mark's been charged with 13 counts of perjury in his life. Willing to life to a judge, this guy. Judge, okay. priest, you name it. Eric <laughs> does long-term rentals for the snowbird crowd and home sales and purchases for those who want to stay a while longer. Are you a baseball player or parent who needs a place in the Phoenix area? Eric will help you find the perfect spot fast. Want to spend your day shanking golf balls into the great beyond? Eric knows the golf scene like Mike knows the despair that comes from finishing the last Girl Scout cookie. I've already finished all mine and I'm so pissed. <laughs> Find Eric online at ericoxer.com if you can figure out how to spell his name. It's E R I C K A U X I E R.com. Or just shoot him a text at 480 383 9745. That's 480 383 9745. Even if you're just curious about what he can do for you, he's 100% no pressure. One of the best people we know. And for him, the Lombada is not a forbidden dance. What's up? <laughs> Welp, it's time for my least favorite part of the season. <laughs> Our preseason over-under predictions. I, it took us 50 minutes to get to this segment just because I don't want to be here. <laughs> Take your butt whooping. Take your butt whooping like a man. <laughs> I feel contractually obligated to tell you that mine have not gone well in years past. I've killed them. While, while Mike's has gone have gone slightly better been beating on him if you're new to the show before every season mike and i undertake the foolish task of predicting certain statistical outcomes for the team and for specific players including things like ops or home runs record that sort of thing 
we use an over under format to give ourselves a 50 50 chance and somehow we're still wrong so often <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're True. really bad at this. We don't, uh, we bet on green when we play roulette. That's how terrible yeah. we are. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Luckily this time, Alex is here to show us how it's done. Uh, <laughs> we'll start with a tough one. Actually, they're, they're all tough ones. <laughs> Nick yeah. Prado over under 450 plate appearances this season. Mike, uh, I'm going under, but this, you were right. This is a tough one. It was a tough one for me. I sat there and started thinking like, well, if he's not up for the first month, what does that mean in plate appearances? And so, yeah, I think it's going to be under, but I think he gets up here and has a lot. So I think even then you're still sharing with Vinny. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm putting him around 300 for this year. I think if he started on the big league roster, it'd still be under. Really? If he started on, it'd be under. Why? I think, I think when he gets up here, it's in a part-time role three to four times a week. And I don't think three to four times a week – gets you 450 plate appearances in a season in the bottom of the lineup. Yeah, he probably will be in the bottom. That'll take basically 20 plate appearances for every spot he goes down. And so, uh, yeah, that made it tough. I also went under because I like to win. And so I was like, if he's not <laughs> going to be up here. And then the, you throw in the added risk of injury that any player has, you know, like there's a decent chance under 450 is is the outcome. Vinny Pasquantino over under 125 weighted runs created plus. I'm going under for this too, but I'm going barely under. I think he's in that like 120 range. I said that's exactly right. Like, can I can I gamble? <laughs> that's on betting green? on green. You're betting on green. <laughs> <laughs> bet on green here. I bet. Let's circle back to it. I think in <laughs> August we're looking at him being at like right at 125. I think that's. I'll give you 125 number. plus or minus three. How about I that? Take I would absolutely oh. take it. I think that's a slam dunk. <laughs> that's a, that's I think a it takes him a little bit to get going off the shoulder injury, but I think he has a monster second half of the season. That's a gift. I'm going over because I believe in my boy Vinny. I believe in his approach at the plate. I believe he's great and he's going to hit for some power. And I think he kind of started to find it there towards the end of spring training too. So I believe in Vinny. He's going over 125. Bobby Witt Jr. over under five and a half F war. This is tough because I this absolutely is love him. I, I had to choose. I, I started at six and a half F4, and I was like, uh, I don't know, five and a half F4. I'm going to go under, but again, I think he's, if you said, if, he, if you'd said it at five, I'd definitely be over. It'd be 100%, no problem, no worries. Um, I think he's going to be under, but it's going to be just barely. And, and I think it's likely because of something we're not even like counting on. Like for some reason, his defensive numbers are slightly worse or something like that. Like stuff that isn't even, you know, like a couple balls bounce off his glove and hands. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not, I don't think it's going to be because he takes big offensive regression or anything like that. Maybe, maybe he doesn't quit hit quite 30 home runs or something like that. So I think he's going to have a fantastic year. I just think five and a half, I think it's a tough number to get to for anybody. And, and so I'm going just slightly under. Oh, he's going way over. I think he's going to be closer Six to and seven. Six and a half? Than, I think he'll okay. be closer to seven than five. Okay. I, I don't I think people realize that Fangraphs, if you if you take his overall uh, offensive output, he wasn't actually that spectacular last year. Like a 115 weighted runs created plus, we're talking about Vinny being at 125. If you're telling me Bobby can't get to 125, I think you're crazy. I think Bobby can get to 130, 135. And if his defense doesn't come down, that's a seven to eight win player. I think Bobby is in for an absolutely monster borderline MVP caliber season. Yeah, I would have gone over at six and a half too. But I but then I looked at his number from last year and I was like, well, I know Mike, he's not gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna predict big, you know, projection or big progression from this guy. And so I Play put it win. at five and a half. No, yeah, he plays he plays the <laughs> conservative role. Uh no, I'm going over because I think he's gonna see like a three percent jump minimum in his walk rate. And I think that is going to be the thing that ultimately catapults his offensive production into the, the stratosphere. People forget that like the first half of the season last year, he wasn't very good offensively. He was basically a league average hitter for half a season. And then he went on a tear in the second half. And so if he just continues that and the spring seems to suggest that he will, he'll be, he'd be, I think over five and a half, but I think he's actually going to take a slight step forward with his increase in, uh, in walk in on base ability. Don't get too excited. Michael Garcia over under 400 slugging. First, I would like to say maybe my pro approach to this game as being a good big brother 
and finally letting you win one. How about that? <laughs> um, yeah. I'm going over 400 for Michael Garcia's slugging percentage. And actually, I thought this was the easiest one. I was like, I think this is a no brain over. I think he is somewhere in the 425 range. I really do. Um, I think he's going to hit a lot more doubles. And I think we see him hit over 10 home runs. I mean, I think I really do 10 to 15 home runs. I don't think is even out of the, I think that's a given. So I'm, I'm pumped for Michael Garcia this year. I am. I will say that there were a number of minor league seasons where he did not make it over 400 as a slugging. And of course he did not last. Have you seen him? He's jacked now. He's a little bit bigger. He's a little (laughs) bigger, but you know, Alex, what are you going way over? Way over. I think he's going to, I think he's going to hit 300. You think he's going to hit 300 as an average? That'll get him up over 400. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think he's going to go over as well, but I don't think he's getting over 300 as an average. But I do think some changes in swing, some slight changes in approach. What's weird is now, at least in spring, when the games you watched, you could see that when he's in 2 0, 3 1 counts, he's looking to turn and burn big time. Like he wants to pull the ball, hit it hard, and hit it over the fence in certain counts. I think that's going to get him over 400 as a slugging and maybe it'll be just over 415 420 but i think he's gonna make it can i give you guys a hot take sure Ooh, we love hot takes here he's, he's going to the all-star game Ooh, oh, i love I that as a third a baseman you think massive. he's gonna have enough power that's production tough. as a third baseman that's tough Ooh. i'm trying to think of the other al third baseman there's I'm like, a bunch of good ones. Jose Ramirez, yeah. Alex Bregman. Oh, yeah, Jose Grady. Ramirez. I mean, there's... Bregman's waning a little bit offensively. Uh, but Leonard, yeah. Leonard Henderson's going to move to shortstop. Oh, yeah. And I think I think he's going as a third baseman. All right. I hope so. Um, here's a guy who I hope goes as well. Nelson Velasquez, and Alex thinks this number is crazy. Uh, Nelson Velasquez over under 28 home runs. I'm going over, baby. I believe in Nelson Velasquez. I believe he's going to come out in and hit at least 30 home runs as long as he gets the playing time, which I think he will. I think that he's going to, I think he's going to take off in this first month and I think they keep him in there. So Nelson Velasquez over 28 home runs. Tell me why I'm wrong, Alex. If you cut that number in half from last year, his home run to fly ball ratio at 16%, it's still pretty high. Like that's still a pretty good home run to fly ball ratio at 16%. That gives him, we'll give him nine home runs in 50 games. Multiply that by three and you're at 27. And that's, I think, a really fair regression number. I'm going under. I just, I don't see, like, you you, you don't hit on Cole Reagans and Nelson Velasquez in the same season, right? They can't, they, they can't both be real. So <laughs> I'm leaning to the under. I think there's a reason you got Velasquez, Rose, Quas, um, I, I just don't think – I think Nelson Velasquez was a mirage last year. Why not us? That's what I'm saying. I'm going over as well <laughs> on this one. So why not us? You know, And here's why. And I've, I've, I've heard all of the stuff on he won't repeat his ISO, he can't hit for that much power again and all this sort of stuff. I'll tell you why the Cubs were willing to trade him. The Cubs were willing to trade him because he didn't hit the ball in the air enough with the Cubs. He was actually a little bit like uh, Edward Olivares in terms of batted ball outcomes. He hit too many ground balls. He hit a launch angle that was, you know, in the eight to 12 range a lot and not really in the, you want him up in the 30 to 35 range because they're going to get out a lot from that. And that's what he did with the Royals last year. Now, will he duplicate it? I won't say he'll duplicate that power output, though his expected slugging was only 10 points lower than his actual slugging last year. So we know that he was hitting the ball hard and he was hitting in the air last year. I think he'll come down a little bit on that, but if he gets the plate appearances, which I think he will, because I think they believe in his ability, I think he's going over 28. It's also important to note that he had a really slow spring last year as well, right? He had a really slow spring last year. They sent him to AAA. To start the season, he came back with the Cubs and he played with the Cubs. He had something like 40 to 50 plate appearances with the Cubs and had an OPS over 900. But for some reason, they sent him back down to AAA. And so, you know, I don't know if they just had a too many outfielder situation or whatever, but this dude can put the ball out of the ballpark. I'm looking for good stuff from him. And honestly, I think they're going to abandon the Hunter Renfro experiment relatively quickly in one form or another. Let's move on to the pitchers. Everybody wants to talk about Cole Reagans anyway. Cole Reagan's over under 140 innings pitched, Mike. I'm saying over, but that's more of like a hope 
than anything else. Um, there isn't really anything in the history of, of Cole Reagans that should say, Hey, he's going to pitch over 140 innings, but I really hope that he does. And so I'm going over <laughs> if he doesn't, I, I don't know what the Royals have, honestly. Like I don't, they're nowhere. If he pitches yeah. under, well, really if he pitches under 125, they're like completely lost. If they pitch under 140, they're never getting above 78 wins. Probably. This is a really good number. It's like the Vinny number for me. Um, I'm going to go under because, like you said earlier, Marcus, one minor injury can derail that, especially if his starts after an injury are shorter. Um, I'm going to go under, but I think the obvious answer is if he's anything like last year, he's going way over. So if I was actually betting money, I would take the under. But I think if you're if you're asking me what I think his performance will be, I think performance wise he goes way over. Yeah, it, I agree with you. If if he's performing the way he did last year and he stays healthy, he he could go way over. I wonder to what degree they'll let him go over that number. I chose that number because it's like forty five innings more than he pitched last year, right? And so the Royal teams typically don't love to take guys more than fifty innings above where they were the previous year but he's their number one starter. You make a guy a number one starter knowing that if he just makes every single start, he'll have like 34 starts and, you know, he would be throwing 200 innings maybe. And so he's not going to try that for that. I I don't think, but we'll see where they end up being like, how much are they going to let Cole Reagan's pitch this year? Yeah. Well, and that's, I think that's the great point. And that's this, this is a huge uh, point for Alex is under is if the Royals are out of it by September, they're going to come up with some injury and put it in shelf. Oh, he's him. not. Yeah, I he's mean, he's not pitching in September. He's not pitching in September if they're not in it. So um, that right there will put you under. So shrewd move, Alex. That's usually my oh, go-to. Shrewd. Those types of things. Uh, let's talk about another guy who innings probably get limited to some degree. Seth Lugo over under four ERA. This was a really tough one for me. I'm going under, but I think it will just be barely. And it's mostly because I buy into what he was doing in San Diego and he's moving to another big ballpark. And I know he's a ground ball. He does a good job getting ground balls, but I feel like uh, with a great defense behind him and a park that's tough to hit it out of, I feel like Seth Lugo is going to be right around that four, honestly. Um, but I'm going to go under just because I, I, I do believe in what he did. That's a really good number. Um I'm going to say over just barely. My computer is dying, and so the internet's not moving very fast. But the number of pitchers to throw like 140 innings and keep their ERA under four last year was like the perfect number um, for what where I was going earlier. Again, I can't get it to load, of course. So um, I'll say over, but only because I think – one bad month really skews what that could be. Um, but like, I, I fully expect him to be at 4.05 and throw like 140, 150 innings and, and be that kind of innings eater that the Royals really need and be really effective in doing so. Not a Jordan Lyles, like, Hey, his arm won't actually fall off if he throws all these innings. <laughs> um, last year, there were 76 arms that threw 140 innings and, 39 or wait, no, 38 of them had an ERA over four and 38 had an ERA under four. So four is like literally the average. Um, oh, okay. Great. That's where I was going earlier. So I'm like, I think that's exactly what Seth Lugo can be. He threw something like 134 innings last year, I want to say. Um, so a 40 in like getting up to 180 even wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility for him, especially for a guy who's already 33, 34. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if they decided to take him that route. I'm going to go slightly over as well, but it is just slightly. I think anything between four and 4.25 would be acceptable from him. You would say, good, good job. Throw us 170 to 180 innings with that, and we'll take it. Um, last year, I think his FIP was somewhere around 4.25, but he gets that good ground ball rate, which will help him. He prevents home runs well. That'll help him. And so, you know, there's a chance he goes under four, but I'd be perfectly happy with slightly over four as well. Yeah, and just for context, really quick, Mark, sorry. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. last year, Sandy Alcantara threw 184 innings, had an ERA of 4.14, and Fangraphs had him at three wins. 
I, guess I would take that really good. Pick. No, all I'd be dying day for that from Seth Lugo. We'll take that all day. Um, we talked about the linchpin to this rotation. You guys believe is Brady Singer. Brady Singer over under eighty five percent combined sinker slider usage. I thought this was a clever one from me. This is a really good one, and I would like to reiterate: not linchpin, X factor could go either way. X factor. <laughs> he's not sorry. He, we're not sure he's holding this thing together. He may be. T- well, he may be breaking this thing. thing apart. Here's the thing: you pull the linchpin, it's over. Like it's, it's over. All yeah. Falling apart. It's a good point. Um, I'm going over eighty five percent combined usage for the sinker and the slider. Mostly because I have no evidence that it won't be. And I think when he starts to see not success, he runs back to where it's safe. And he feels like it's safe with his sinker and his slider. And so I feel like he's going to be going back there quite a bit. Um, It's not going to be a good thing, though. If he's at 85% combined or higher, that's not a good thing for the Royals. It's his blankie. (laughs) Yeah. Alex? I'm going to say over 90%. Because I think he winds up in the bullpen, and from mm. July through the end of the season, it's one hundred percent. Just sinker slider, as hard as you can wild. throw. It. I can tell you, last year it was something around ninety three percent. I think uh, sinker slider. I could be wrong by that number, but it's, it was well over ninety. Uh, and so you're you're saying it could be over ninety again. All right, I'm going to have some faith in our boy Brady Singer. Okay, I'm going to say under, or really it's more faith in the coaching staff, or maybe both, I guess. Uh, Under 85%, just barely. I think it'll be something around 80% for that sinker-slider combo. But then mix in some four-seamers, mix in some sweepers, mix in some change-ups. Even if he could do something like that, it would be somewhat of a step forward for him. And boy, does he desperately need it. All right, we're talking about friend of the show, Alec Marsh, for this one. Alec Marsh over under 1.6 home runs per nine allowed in uh, in 2024. Mike, your thoughts? I think it. I think it's under. I think we've seen some improvement. I don't know that it's greatly under like we would want it to be, but I think he does get under that, yes. And I think that if he does go under that, I think he sticks in the starting rotation as long as he's healthy. For context for the audience here, 1.6 is still high for a home it runs is. per nine, <laughs> but his last year was 1.9. And so just some, some context. There were 127 pitchers last year that threw 100 innings. Only 23 of them had a home runs per nine over 1.6. I think a lot of Alec Marsh's problems stem from fastballs that are too much in the zone. And I think that is ironically a very fixable problem. I'm going to go way under. I think he gets this number under 1.3. That would be, that would be a revelation for the Royals. If he can get the number under 1.3, he doesn't even need to improve his walk rate. Like he could keep the same walk rate and he would be a mid rotation starter. If he can keep it under 1.3, like that would be amazing. Let's do it. Alec Marsh, speak it into existence. Make it happen, buddy. Uh, I'm also going to go under. I think like Mike, it'll be a, a little bit under 1.6. We're talking 1.5-ish maybe, uh, which could still be successful if he limits some walks and he, you know, he's still getting a lot of strikeout things. But uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking he'll get under the 1.6 number, which would be a great improvement from him. Last one for personal players. I wanted to get a bullpen guy in here just to not be biased. Uh, James MacArthur over under 15 saves for the Royals. I'm going over because I'm an I'm a James MacArthur stand now, newly minted James MacArthur stand. Um, I'm going over because I think this is how it plays out. I think Will Smith gets traded at the deadline, and so I think MacArthur slides back into that primary closer role. And I so I think you see him get roughly five when, you know, on days when Will Smith can't go or something like that in the first half. But I think you see him get somewhere between ten and fifteen in the second half, and so that's where that's where I think it'll even out. And I think MacArthur probably somewhere around twenty saves. By the end of the year. Another guy that I think is making the all-star game. That wouldn't surprise me. Well, that wouldn't surprise me either, honestly. Like, I don't know if in what role, like, I don't, I don't think he even needs to be a closer to make it, but this dude is, has been so impressive. (laughs) I'm going way over. I think this guy is the closer by May. Um, He is legitimately very good. And the stuff is off the charts. Good. I know. I know we got let go by the Phillies, 
but that was a good team with a roster crunch. That was not just giving up on a talented pitcher because they couldn't figure it out. I think he goes way over. I think Garcia, Witt, and MacArthur are all th- the three all stars for the Royals in July. Very, very good. I'm going under, mostly just to be different than Mike, but also because. Because of how much Quatrero talks about using matchups and doing rotation and all this sort of stuff, I just don't know that he's going to get enough opportunities. And like, even if even if Will Smith gets traded in May, he will have had to be the right matchup at the right time in the first half, and they will have had to been in enough games in the second half to for it to matter, right? Like, they're going to have to win a certain number of games in the second half for him to be able to get over that 15 save mark. I hope they do, but I'm not going to predict that they will. You know what I'm saying? And I know I sprung this on you guys late because I didn't put it in the line, uh, the outline initially, but I forgot that we didn't uh, come up with a record prediction. So really quickly, do some math, get out your fingers and toes, and tell us what you think the record is going to be this year. Mike, you get to start. Let's see. How many games did they win last year? They won 56. Ooh, oh yeah. real <laughs> scrappy 56. A real, uh, a gentleman's 56, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> Uh, didn't, want, didn't want to show off, you know. Um, okay, uh, I'm going. Gosh, I'm gonna go 74 wins, which gives what? I should have done my maths. Didn't do my maths. 162 minus 88. 74, 88 losses. 74 and 88. Put it in there. You can pretty much put it in stone because that's gonna be happening. Um. That's my that's my record prediction. I think you see uh, all star appearances by uh, Bobby Witt Jr., Cole Reagans if he stays healthy, uh, possibly James McArthur as well. He's he's very been very impressive. But I do think you see a sell off at the tra- at the trade deadline. I think you see Hunter Renfro go. I think if he's still even on the team, I think you see uh, Will Smith go. I think you see a, a couple of those bullpen arms possibly, and I think you definitely see a Waka or a Lugo. Probably not both, but one or the other go as well. Alex, what are your thoughts? Uh, I disagree with all that. Okay. <laughs> I disagree That's with it. all of it. We're fighting. <laughs> You're dumb, Mike. You're real dumb. <laughs> That's it. We're fighting. Mind you, two-time winner of this thing, by the way. This guy. Two times in a row. Back-to-back yeah, champ I mean, here. The bar was pretty low for you. Though. I actually think the Royals are above 500 at the deadline. Shut up. With the first schedule they have the first two months? I think they're going to be above five or right at it at the deadline. I think they keep everybody. Maybe they sell off a piece or two. I think they end up winning 79 games. I got them going 79 and 83. Yeah. That 49 Mark typed in there is closer than, than what that 79 is. I thought I would be the (laughs) highest one on them. Honestly, I thought I would be the top. (laughs) You guys never learn. You never learn. Captain optimistic over here. All right, I'm going with 78 and 84. I think that they are probably closer to competing than not at the deadline, but still prudently decide to move a few pieces like Will Smith, maybe like a uh, Chris Stratton or you know some some of their relief pieces at the very least. Um, maybe even Hunter Renfro. I would move. I, I'd be moving Hunter Renfro right now if I could. <laughs> I probably never would have signed Hunter Renfro, but. That's where they are right now. And so I think 78 and 84 is a really realistic outcome for them. Um, hoping for more, but we'll see. Royals Weekly is brought to you by All In Physical Therapy. No, you're staying, Alex. You're staying. I get, my computer is dying. I have to go. Oh, fine. I know. All right. I love you guys, though. Good to see you, man. Well, thank you so <laughs> much for joining us, man. Yep. Yeah. Royals Weekly is brought to you by All In Physical Therapy. You already know that All In Physical Therapy helped turn our mother into the Incredible Hulk. But what you don't know is that mom loved her experience there because of the personal attention she got from Tommy and the staff at All In. They guarantee a personalized one-on-one experience to suit the needs of patients recovering from total joint surgeries, sports injuries, or any kind of injury or pain. I'm dealing with the pain of missing out on the last Krispy Kreme at work the other day, but that's more emotional pain. Not physical yeah, think, pain. Yeah, I don't think they deal with that. But All In Physical Therapy is owned and operated by Tommy Freevert with locations in Blue Springs and Lee Summit. But most importantly, they're in network for nearly all insurance providers. Good, because the last time I went out of network, my uncle told me that he didn't love me. 
Yeah, that's true. Uh, if you're a high school athlete recovering from injury or someone bouncing back with brand new hip or knee, check out the best physical therapy in the KC Metro at allin-pt.com. That's A-L-L-I-N-PT.com. Or give them a call at 816-427-5300. That's 816-427-5300. It's almost here. I can taste it. Opening day is Thursday, March 28th, which will kick off the season for the Royals here at home against the defending AL Central champs, the Minnesota Twins. Mike, tell us about that twin series and do it quickly because this episode is way too long. <laughs> Minnesota Twins are 0-0 zero and because zero everybody is. They're tied for first and last in the AL Central, although they are considered the prohibitive favorite, having won the division last year. Good, uh, Good rotation, good lineup. All we know is opening day. It'll be Cole Reagans versus Pablo Lopez, the 28-year-old right-handed pitcher out of Venezuela. Last year, he had a 3.66 ERA and a 1.15 whip. He real good. Um, he's got a four-seam fastball that averages 95 miles per hour, a sweeper, a changeup, a curveball, a sinker, and he throws all of those pitches, or he doesn't throw any of those pitches more than 10% or no, more than 35% of the time. Um he throws all of them at least 10%. He mixes it up really well. Great young starter. And they've got a stable behind him as well in Joe Ryan, Chris Paddock, Bailey Ober. Um, all I think, are those all homegrown guys? Paddock's not. Pa he, play, he pitched oh, okay. for uh, San Diego for a number of years. Okay. I know Pablo Lopez wasn't a homegrown guy, but uh, mm -hmm. but Joe Ryan is. He's a good pitcher too. And their lineup looks really good too. Carlos Correa. Byron Buxton has dealt with a little bit of a back thing in the spring. but He looks like he's going to be healthy. Um, Edward Julian rookie came out last year at second base and did really, really well. Royce Lewis, their third baseman, uh, a, a good young piece as well. So shortstop this year, I think. Oh, oh is no, Royce right? Lewis he playing probably, shortstop? This he year? probably will play third because Korea is probably playing Korea's short. So play I don't short, know. So. All right. We'll see. Him. Yeah. Anyway, it's a good lineup pretty much top to bottom. So it's a tough test to open the, to open the year with. So. We'll end this week's episode like we end every episode with a Just About Outside segment where we talk about something that's interesting to us outside the world of baseball. Mike, what is interesting to you as we move into this opening week? Uh, well, this is something, a bit of advice that I tend to give people. So some people don't know this about me, but I have a hobby in personal finance. And so I, I'm, I've greatly learned a lot about personal finance in my life. And uh, so sometimes my colleagues at work or my wife's friends will come to me and ask me like advice about stuff. And probably the piece of advice that I give out more than any is to know the job market better than your employer knows the job market. Okay. So my, my wife was telling me a story about one of her coworkers uh, this past weekend. And it just reminded me like how important it is to understand your value in the market and that labor us employees is a market. And Mark does this all the time. Mark understands this. We've talked about this a lot. He always is out there looking to see. Now it's a little bit different for people like me and Alex. We are in uh, public jobs. We're teachers. We're both teachers. And so it's a little bit different, but especially if you work in the, in the uh, private sector, you have got to constantly be knowing what is out there. And honestly, I would say very consistently be inquiring about some of those things. Um, I know there's been news stories and things out that Gen Z, especially, and, and even younger millennials and the millennial generation, that we move jobs more frequently than all the generations before us. There's a reason for that. Companies are not really loyal to employees, but oftentimes they'll, they'll talk about you being loyal to them. Well, what are they going to give you for being loyal to them is the question. And Exploitation one of our older brothers, is yeah, the answer for that. One of our older brothers does hiring <laughs> for a large financial company. And he's even told me things like this, like it's really sucks because companies won't let you pay employees that are currently with you more money, but they'll allow you to give more money to new people that you hire so that you'll hire people who are making more money than people who've been there for two or three years sometimes. And that is a function of the fact that they know you're not going to go out there and look for a new job. Okay. And so always one, at least once a week, this is the best advice I can give to kind of anybody, at least once a week, you should be going out there and exploring your job market. And if you're single or you don't have ties to this area, whatever area you're in, look outside your city too. go find. If you know who the competitors for your, that your current employer are, go look for them, go see what they're paying people and go, you know, even send an, an HR, you know, Hey, you didn't list the salary in this job thing. Uh, you know, 
I, I can't afford to take a pay cut. Just be professional and polite about it. And they'll tell you what they're paying. Um, you know, always know what's out there because one, the chopping block could be any time and you'll never see it coming. And two, you should always be able to use that as leverage with your current employer because they would do it for you to you if, if they could. Right. They will not treat you any better than you're going to treat them. Like that's just the way it works. Right. And so I try to tell this to so many people, especially young people, sometimes young people. And I, I, I work in higher education and you know, it's people think for some reason that that's like a different, that things operate differently there. It absolutely does not. Right. Like, and so, you know, the best you can do is look out for yourself because they are not looking out for you. They are not in any sort of way looking out for you. And so, yeah, be as utilitarian and as self-centered as you need to be uh, as an employee and as a, as a member of the labor force. Uh, so glad you brought that up. I'm bringing up, I wanted to talk about movies and television, but I, I really, the only one that came to mind was uh, this new show I've been watching. Uh, it's the uh, Avatar, The Last Airbender live action show. Like I just watched it the other day and I'm not bringing it up because it's a great show. Okay. I'm not suggesting that you watch it, right? Like, <laughs> but I am bringing up the notion that I love movies and TV shows that try things that like are willing to take a chance on things. Right. And so Avatar, the last airbender, the live action show, which just came out, took a chance on adapting a, a, an animated series that is very difficult to adapt, like very, very hard to do it didn't work very well because the acting is bad and the writing is bad, <laughs> but at least they tried, right? Like I'm, I'm interested in watching movies and television that tries to do something really cool and really great. And it's sometimes really big because we can find a thousand shows trying to do nothing new that are just going to sort of Mike, Mike loves one of them. They're called happy endings. And I like it. Big too, fan. show. Big, it, but it's, it's not doing anything new, right? Like it's just, it's, it, it is the sitcom you've seen a thousand different times, right? Like I want to watch you, a television show that's trying something different. That's doing something new. That's interesting to me, right? Like uh, shows like Peaky Blinders, for example, a show that takes a very not talked about subject. It tries to do the gangster sort of genre set in Great Britain though, instead of the United States and with a whole lot of interesting things done sonically, like with the soundtrack and with the score of the show and everything like that, it's doing something interesting and new. The Wire did something interesting and new. Like that's just TV shows. I'm a huge fan of this one movie called Cloud Atlas. If you've never seen it, it's about, it's a Wachowski movie. I left the theater thinking to myself, I've never seen anything like that. It was an amazing experience even though I know that there are flaws in that movie, right? Like, and so I'm willing to give a movie or television show credit just for taking a big swing, even if it doesn't hit a home run on that big swing. You know what I'm saying? Mike, yeah, that's something you wanted to rudely interrupt me for. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say, like, you will see this uh, in sitcoms as well. Like, the ones that take those big chances a lot of times get rewarded with big accolades. And I'm thinking of Modern Family, and I'm thinking of Veep. Those were two examples where you saw not only just, and The Office, I mean, uh, although you know, the British version did the big leap and the American version just stole that. But um, you, you see that and then you'll see like the copycat versions of that, you know, whereas Happy Endings, a show that I absolutely love, it's a copycat version of Friends. Like it's it's hit the Friends model and, and kept going with it. Um, but you look at Modern Family, that was an ensemble thing that was very big and different at the time and won a bajillion awards. The Veep thing was, you know, Julie Louis Dreyfus was kind of the, the center of that, but you it took like hardcore political humor and put it right in there. And then people were like, ate it up, you know? Um, and so, yeah, that there is, there is room for that in the sitcom realm as well. And I, and I do appreciate it when, when it's done right. Right. And we can talk about shows that are like, you know, that do that, that sort of not taking chances thing and, and are hugely successful as a result of it. Things like big bang theory and stuff like that. But the ones I feel like that we really hold on to the Sopranos uh, Breaking Bad, uh, even even comedies like um, like Mash and stuff like that. Oh yeah, that one. There or Scrubs. They're the ones that where we're like, oh, that seems like it's going to stick in the cultural sort of conversation a lot longer as a result of having taken a chance, and then you can talk about it more in, in, in interesting ways. So I appreciate those sorts of things a little bit more. This isn't for anyone because our listeners probably aren't movie and television producers, but if you are. Make more of those things. <laughs> Take chances more. Or at the very least, as a, as a viewer, 
uh, take a chance on something that looks like it's trying something different because sometimes that'll be a big reward for you, even if it ends up having some flaws. You know what doesn't have any flaws, Mike? Royals Weekly. So come back <laughs> next week. It's an hour and 30 minute episode. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> uh, so make sure you're tuning in uh, for our Wednesday episode, which will also be flawless. Uh, Royalsweekly.substack.com. And come back next week because we'll have actual baseball to talk about. I am so pumped. Mm -hmm. Until then, be good to each other. And go Royals. <laughs>